Well, hello and welcome to Idol Killer, a ministry dedicated to destroying sacred cows for the cause of Christ. I'm your host, Warren McGrew, and uh, a good while back, a Calvinist by the name of Derek Morell, he went on Pine Creek to discuss Christianity from a Calvinist perspective. How do I become a Christian? You believe, you're kind of your sins, you, um, you believe in Christ? I don't believe though. So how, do, how would I ever become a Christian? God, you have to be regenerated. How, so, do I, how do I get regenerated? By the Holy Spirit. That's how do I get the Holy Spirit to regenerate me? You don't. Now, as you can imagine, his comments were seen as controversial among many Christians. Even many Calvinists took issue with his presentation. I, I personally saw uh, what he said to be uh, more of a presentation of the anti-gospel, something so diametrically opposed to Scripture in the actual gospel. Neighbor. I heard about your heresy, and we've made it our mission to win you back to the flock. Uh, the word gospel comes from a Greek word which literally means good news. And in the New Testament, it refers to the announcement that Jesus has redeemed humanity, announcing an end of futility and conquering the hold of the grave. And this is all done because God desires mercy more than judgment. For God so loved the world. Truly, good news. Great, great news. As we read in Mark 1, verse 15, Jesus said, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, Derek didn't care too much for all the criticism. He, he thought himself to be somewhat heroic in the fact that he held to a consistent form of Calvinism. Uh, he bit the bullet, as it were. And in the months uh, since his discussion with Doug, he enthusiastically encouraged me to go on Pine Creek and present my views on Christianity. Now, regular viewers of the channel will know that I tend to stick with Christian doctrine, church history, philosophy of religion, all of which have their place in Christian apologetics, but I don't consider myself to be a great apologist. You're a Christian. Christian. <laughs> but when I'm dealing with, uh, with unbelievers, with atheists, no matter whether they're on the agnostic spectrum or militant evangelical atheists, as it were, I prefer friendly and respectful dialogue, and I really enjoy when uh, they can commit themselves to the same. This free flow of ideas and just kind of transparency and honesty uh, about the strengths and weaknesses of our perspective views, I find to be very edifying. It helps build my faith, and um, I find that uh, people genuinely, more often than not, enjoy that. And there are smarter far more articulate apologists than myself. So um, not necessarily the, my, my wheelhouse or a, a strength that I like to play to. Um, but that fact doesn't get me off the hook. Scripture says we need to be ready to give an account, to explain what we believe and why we've committed our lives to Christ. So I eventually agreed to go on Pine Creek and discuss uh, all sorts of things with Doug. Well, yeah, we accomplished, we covered a lot of ground there from Calvinism to non-Calvinism to omniscience to grounding, infinite regress, historical stuff. You know, he and I, well, we, we talk a lot and... Uh... Now, a, a brief word about Doug. I, I, I like him. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, but uh, I like Doug. He reminds me a lot of several friends that I have who are also atheists. So I really enjoyed our conversation. He made me laugh several times. I think I got, to, uh, got him to laugh a, a few times as well. And uh, all while discussing some very important topics. Uh, and I don't think either one of us left the exchange uh, feeling offended or, or holding a grudge. I like Warren. I think he's a great guy, but I, I think he likes to, to talk a lot. Uh, yeah, guilty as charged. I went on his show to discuss Christianity and present the gospel in really the most simplistic terms that I could manage. Yeah, and I think Warren's main concern for a guy like me is not to believe the Calvinists. They are not to be trusted. He wants to give me that hope that I can choose this day whom I will serve. 
And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Warren's main concern for a guy like me is, I love you, man. And I get that. How do I become a Christian? You believe, you repent of your sins, you, um, you believe in Christ. I don't believe, though. So how, do, how would I ever become a Christian? God, you have to be regenerated. How, so, do I, how do I get regenerated? By the Holy Spirit. How it's do a, I get the Holy Spirit to regenerate me? You don't. You're right. You gave the right answer. <laughs> well, I was going to lie to you and say all that. Well, you have to believe in your heart and all. Yeah, I mean. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Well, you know, I was going to lie to you and say all that, well, you have to believe in your heart and all Is there but, something I can do to get salvation? Not of, not of your own. Not, right. Not of your own so God has to do something, right? And if he doesn't do it, I go to hell for eternity. But uh, see, you're not a lifeboat lifeboat analogy person. Like this is why I love Calvinists is because I'm sinking. I'm in, I'm in the ocean. I'm drowning. Right. And and it's not Calvinism is not God is handing you a lifeboat or a life preserver and saying if you grab it you're saved. No, God actually has to give you the life preserver through Christ. Pick up your hand, take your hand, and have your hand grab the life preserver and then carry you up out of the water. God is doing all that. Correct. Yes, we believe actually, we believe he actually saves people, unlike a lot of right, other Christians. Right. Yeah. So if I go to hell, it's because of what God didn't do. He didn't grab my hand. He didn't place it on the life preserver. He didn't lift me up. If he passes people over, which he does, they still die in their sins. There's right. still a command to be saved. There's still a command to repent. Right, but I can't repent, can I? Without God. Not without God. You get nothing. You lose. I, I don't know how you sleep at night believing this, <laughs> to be honest, because every single person in hell today is in hell today, if your worldview is correct, because of what God didn't do. Correct. We all gave, we all gave Derek a hard time because he came on your show and he said, well, Derek, what do I need to be, what do I need to do to be saved? And he's like, uh, sorry, bud, you're out of luck. You got to sit around and wait for God. And if he wants you, you'll be his. And we call that the anti-gospel. There's no real good news there. Let me ask you questions, the same questions I asked Derek. <clears throat> I'm not a Christian. I reject the core propositions. How do I become a Christian? You, you have to believe on Christ, confess and trust in him and, and commit to following him. Just trust in what he's done. Um, that's when you're presented with the gospel. I'm also an inclusivist. So um, I don't believe that those who have never heard um, are doomed to hell. I think that this is a, a gracious God. And so I believe that uh, God judges those who do by nature what the law requires and that their conscience will either condemn or excuse them when he judges them. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Okay, but how do I actually believe and trust in God if I don't currently believe and trust in God? Like, how would I even get there? Yeah, uh, I mean, you, you hear, you, you respond, and uh, and, and you're convinced. Um, we're not talking about like Cartesian certainty. I, I think that there's a, a real misnomer. Like, uh, you know, we would say that if we say that Christians don't have doubt or reasons not to believe, I think that that would be a complete misrepresentation of, of Christianity or, or at least an ignorant. But what would your advice be to, to what would your advice be to, uh, to become convinced? Just consider, and, and, and please hear me on this. Like I am not, you've had, you've had way more articulate, uh, knowledgeable apologists that you've engaged with. And you've heard the arguments way better than I could do them justice. But I think that ultimately you're presented with the, the, the story of, of what Christ has done and who he is. And there's something that resonates with you and you 
ruminate and reflect on it. And uh, you, you come to believe it and accept it like any, any truth or any worldview. Um, you have to consider it and, and believe in it. Why are you going to heaven and me not? Yeah, so, so we, could, we could distill this down to, you know, talking about the thief on the cross. He, he, didn't, he didn't do a historic cultural analysis of Judaism and, you know, we don't know how many miracles or, or what he saw. He just, he recognized the, the selflessness of Christ, believed and confessed, and something in that experience resonated with him. So, you know, I don't think that either the thief on the cross is coming to belief and his confession. I don't see that as meritorious. And I don't see me as a good student of history as being meritorious either, because God has shown universal provision for all. Like accepting a gift, putting your trust in, in God, that is still meritorious in my view. Well, I mean, if I, if I, if I, if I bought you a brand new watch and you, you didn't like the fact that it was silver and you wanted it as gold and you rejected it, um, or you were thankful and put it on, in either case, there was nothing you did to earn or merit. Okay, but let's let let's say uh, let's up the stakes a little bit. Let's say you give me a gift. Let's say we're underwater, and you give me a gift of an oxygen tank because mine just ran dry. I'd be stupid not to take it if my goal is to live, right? Yeah, if, if your goal if your goal is to live, yeah. rejecting the source of life is not a good idea. Yeah, and so I see. Uh, if someone is underwater, their auction tank runs out and they, and you give them one and they put it on, they did a good thing. Yes. I mean, they are smart. Yes. They value their own life and they did it. Yes. I would How, say it's wise, but that's it's meritorious. meritorious. No, meritorious would be that you earned it. That something that you did in and of yourself demanded or earned that. And, 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 and maybe if you if you say that we have inherent value or intrinsic value, even then I don't think that that would be meritorious. It's that the value is being bestowed upon us by whoever is giving that to us. So I don't see how that would be meritorious. Well, if, you, if it's between life or death and you're making a choice that gives you life. It's like, a smart choice, but you didn't earn it. You know what I mean? Like, but you did it. You did absolutely. There's action that's required, but it's it's a response, not not something that instigated. Well, okay, let's get rid of the word earn. But the bottom line is, let's say um, the reason why you will live and I will die is because of what we did or didn't do. It's yeah. not about God. It's about our response to God. Yeah. So we have the power, not God, to determine if we live or die. I would, I would, I would nuance that. I wouldn't say we have and not God, but thanks to God, we have an opportunity to choose this day, whether we'll choose life or death. And it's because of God that we have that opportunity. He could have just passed by us and we'd never even have an option to choose. He wants to give me that hope that I can choose this day whom I will serve. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Let's up the stakes a little bit. Let's say you give me a gift. Let's say we're underwater and you give me a gift of an oxygen tank because mine just ran dry. I'd be stupid not to take it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. I'd be stupid not to take it. Well, if you if it's between life or death and you're making a choice that gives you life. It's like, a smart choice, but you didn't earn it. You know what I mean? Like But you did it. it as, you did, absolutely. There's action that's required, but it's it's a response, not not something that instigated. Yeah, if you're right, then I'm okay, because uh, I prefer to be annihilated than live forever in heaven. Yeah, it's a choice <laughs> that we make and um, you know, th I think the tragedy though would be to to stand before this God and realize that, that there is a greater answer than what we thought and that there, that this love is, is experienced and perceived in a profound way. And then that we miss out on that. But Jesus describes himself as the way, the truth and the life. And so if we reject, like truly reject him, we're rejecting life. And all that's left is the absence of life. I'd be stupid not to take it. 
Now, I, I used some editing there to draw out how Doug recognized rejecting the source of life is, in his words, stupid, and how he has knowingly made a choice, intentionally choosing death instead of life. And I see that as incredibly tragic. Um, and I, I did this to highlight a contradiction in his view, too, that rejecting the source of life underwater, this he sees as stupid. And yet he is knowingly rejecting the source of eternal life and sees no real issue here as he says he prefers death. Now, this doesn't mean that I don't like Doug, nor is it an attempt on my part to call him stupid. Smart people often hold to a couple stupid beliefs. We're all working in, in, in progress here, you know. Um, so I hope that Doug doesn't take uh, too much offense at, uh, at my pointing this out. Um, but you, you'll also note how Derek, our, our Calvinist friend, recognizes a, uh, a drowning man can't desire to live and choose to accept a life preserver, that there's nothing one can do to be saved. And this strikes me as being in complete opposition to Scripture. In the book of Acts, the jailer asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They weren't good Calvinists, nor did they tell him, there's nothing you can do to be saved. Just hope you're one of the elect and God eventually regenerates you. And may the odds be ever in your favor. Now, Derek's presentation of the anti-gospel didn't go unnoticed. And uh, it wasn't just by uh, Christians like myself that pointed this out, but James White uh, saw the need to step in and do some damage control. This uh, I first saw um, when uh, Warren McGrew said that he was going to be utilizing this clip. And this is an atheist and a Calvinist. And I'll be honest with you, um, I don't know what the context is, and I don't know what came before and after it, so I think that's a little bit unfair. And I, I don't know how much value there is in having a debate with an atheist um, about this subject. I don't think that's what the debate was on. I don't get that feeling. But my point is, the only meaningful way of discussing whether uh, God is sovereign, whether he has a decree of election, uh, is within the context of divine revelation. I mean, we, we are claiming, it'd be like debating the Trinity with an atheist. Why? This morning I retweeted an R.C. Sproul clip where he said that God's absolute sovereignty isn't an, isn't an argument amongst Christians, it's an argument between theists and atheists. <laughs> now, obviously, <laughs> uh, a lot of Christians would disagree with that often and enthusiastically how do i become a christian there's there's no reason to be discussing sovereign grace of god and things like that with someone who just doesn't even believe does it's it bother a, you that basically the reason why i'm not a christian and if i never if i die a non-christian does it bother you that the reason i do not inherit uh, eternal life is because god didn't do something in me first okay so let's uh, let's stop there um, obviously, this particular atheist has some uh, level of knowledge of Reformed theology, and so what he's going to do is he's going to make an argument that is going to ignore the justice of God against sin. It's going to ignore, uh, for example, uh, the federal headship of Adam. It's going to ignore uh, Romans chapter 5. Uh, it's going to ignore Romans chapter 9. It's going to ignore all of that. And as you just heard it expressed, does it bother you that the reason that I will not go to heaven is because God didn't do something for me? Doug asked Derek, does it bother you? And, and what was Derek's answer? Yes. He said, yes, it bothered him. And he referenced Charles Spurgeon weeping over those who are perishing. And in doing so, Derek has claimed to be more compassionate than the God of Calvinism. Let that sink in for a minute. According to Calvinism, God from all eternity effectually decreed these souls to perish in order to demonstrate his glory. God has never given two licks about those who are perishing. Why? Because according to that system, they were created specifically for this purpose. 
Yet Derek and Charles Spurgeon weep for them, showing far more compassion and love than the God of their systematic, presuppositional, philosophical commitment. White gets upset that Doug, this atheist, went straight to the heart of the matter. How dare you, uh, who, who God eternally and effectually decreed not to understand spiritual truth, not consider our presuppositional commitments? How dare you uh, point out that the wicked were damned to hell before they ever existed as a result of God's decree? How dare you point out that the wicked have no hope, that there is no gospel, no good news in Calvinism? White then quickly appeals to the precept of Calvinism as a means of applying a soothing balm to the wounded conscience of his listeners. Wait, wait, don't, don't let your conscience and heart cause you to doubt Calvinism. Listen to my appeal to your intellect and this beautiful systematic theological construct. Obviously, this lowly atheist can't understand. Show him no mind, no regard, no true sympathy. He is exactly as God decreed. That's the nutshell of James's response here. Brainwashing, also known as mind control, menticide, coercive persuasion, thought control, thought reform and forced re-education, is the concept that the human mind can be altered or controlled by certain psychological techniques. Brainwashing is said to reduce its subject's ability to think critically or independently, to allow the introduction of new, unwanted thoughts and ideas into their minds, as well as to change their attitudes, values and beliefs. We all must learn to think presuppositionally. Think presuppositionally, an appeal to suspend critical thinking, reason, wisdom and logic. To conform to group think. What's, what's foundational to that? That God in some sense or fashion is accountable and responsible for doing something for you. What is that something? That something is an act of grace. That something is free grace and mercy. Grace and mercy cannot be demanded. So there's, there's problem number one. Let's tackle James's problem number one. Numero uno. Did Doug assume that God owes him anything? There was nothing in his question that would indicate that. Rather, he assumed the claims of Calvinism are true for the purpose of his question. And he asked Derek what Derek thought about his own doctrine and beliefs, drawing out a serious disconnect. Derek believes men cannot repent and believe, come to faith and be saved, unless God regenerates them. That this is a result of an eternal decree that God had issued. And this troubles Derek. Why? We'll go back to Romans 2, which I I quoted earlier in this video, Derek's conflicting thoughts bear witness and reveal an inconsistency with his doctrine and what God wrote on his heart. So here he is thinking God has damned these people eternally and it grieves him. Disconnect between head and heart. Something in here with his doctrine is not lining up here. Now, keep in mind, the heart can be deceitful. But we shouldn't dismiss such disconnects. We should go back to Scripture and say, what does Scripture say? Why am I thinking this way? We need to pay attention to this sort of uh, pain that results from, from cognitive dissonance. When there's a head and heart disconnect, that should draw our attention and say, hey, there's a problem here. I'm failing to understand this in a, in a, in a nuanced way. Maybe I'm holding on to some conflicting beliefs. I need to go back to Scripture and really study this. So we don't want to be guided purely by our, our heart, and we don't want to be guided purely by our intellect. We want to be a whole person. God gave us a head and a heart for a reason. And one has to ask, since Derek believes that God has eternally and effectually decreed whatsoever comes to pass, why did God decree for Derek to feel bad about people perishing when he decreed they perish? Forget thinking presuppositionally. Think critically. Think reasonably. Think logically. How are you to be a good Berean if you can't even trust the set of tools God gave you? God gave you a mind and a heart for a reason. We should use them. Assumption number two. There's nothing here 
about this man's willful rebellion against his creator, his creation of arguments that try to get rid of the fact that he's a pot, and it says right there at the bottom on the pot, made by the potter. And so there is the continuing rebellion, which is a moral reality. It is rebellion against God. It is continuing sin in and of its own self. So Doug shouldn't ask Calvinists how they feel about their doctrine. That's bad because Doug is doing exactly what God eternally and effectually decreed him to do by asking these questions. Now, if God has decreed whatsoever comes to pass, things like sin and rebellion lose all meaning. Doug isn't sinning. Doug isn't rebelling. Doug is perfectly obeying the eternal decree of God. According to Calvinism, Doug can't think a thought that God hasn't determined him to think. He can't formulate an argument God didn't give him. Yet James is upset that Doug is so obedient to the will of God. Again, revealing a head and heart disconnect, revealing James's conflicting thoughts. Then you have the relationship to Adam. James points to Adam, insisting on the doctrine of federal headship, claiming that God is just to punish us for the sins of Adam, as he was our representative who also perfectly obeyed the effectual decree from God to sin. Do you see how theistic determinism cannot place the blame anywhere but at the feet of God? John MacArthur has famously noted that God is responsible for evil. He said, you can't get him off the hook. R.C. Sproul heavily and repeatedly insinuated that God gave Adam a disposition desiring and effectively bringing about the fall. And of course, uh, James here has said that God de decrees the most disgusting and violent acts of child abuse imaginable because he has some supposed greater purpose to bring himself maximal glory by decreeing every evil that will ever exist. But let's get upset with Doug, our, our friendly atheist here, because Doug is sinning. Even though God decreed Adam to sin and holds Doug guilty for Adam's sin and damned Doug long before Doug ever sinned. Now, if you're new to the channel, then you're probably unfamiliar with the undercutting defeater inherent in total depravity. But you see, since the Calvinist argues that we are born spiritually dead, guilty, with our flesh, will, soul, and intellect corrupt, and incapable of rightly understanding spiritual truth or repenting, this creates a state which then undermines any claim that they may make about understanding spiritual truth. So James here believes it's a spiritual truth he was created incapable of rightly understanding spiritual truth. And he believes we were all created this way. And yet he proceeds to claim that he now rightly understands spiritual truth. It would be laughable were it not so serious. So it, it's just a natural thing for the rebellious man to, uh, to embrace that kind of, of argumentation. The creature is going to say, I reject my creator's right to deal with me as my creator sees fit. Where did Doug say he rejected God's right over his creation? It certainly wasn't when he simply asked Derek, a Calvinist, if his doctrine bothered him. So then this criticism from uh, James must be directed at Derek, because Derek is the one who vocalized his displeasure with his creator's right to do with his creation as he sees fit. Remember, Derek's the one who said it did bother him. And he quoted Charles Spurgeon, who also vocalized his displeasure with his creator's right to do with his creation as he sees fit. And so if they even wanted to try to deal with theology as it's actually revealed in Scripture, they would have to say something along the lines of, does it bother you um, that uh, God treats me in Adam? To which I would say it can bother me no more than he treats me as I am in Christ. Tough luck, kid. So James's response to the question from the atheist is, 
I can't feel bad for you or else I'd have to take issue with God electing to save me. It seems there's no head heart disconnect here as there's no heart for the lost at all. It can't bother me any, any more than that. Then behind all this, and that's about to be fleshed out in a moment, behind all of that then uh, comes the whole creaturely denial that there can be anything outside of what is fully expressible by temporal human language. In other words, I have to take the eternal and collapse it into time and make it all one simple two-dimensional thing. Now recall for a moment that scripture is said to contain God's self-revelation. But James here, James who was born unable to rightly understand spiritual truth until he was zapped with divine gnosis, now James is going to tell us what scripture cannot. That is really the problem. If God does not choose to be gracious to me in this life, isn't that all on him because he made that decision before I came into existence? The question was, if God made the decision for Doug to be created specifically for hell, to sin exactly the way God wanted Doug to sin, to never have the ability to believe and repent, isn't Doug's fate in hell really God's doing? That's the million dollar question. And James recognizes that's the million dollar question. So what is that objection? Well, that objection again requires that you place the fundamental uh, parameters of justice in time upon what God does in eternity. So God cannot have a purpose. I think he called this gentleman Doug. God cannot have a, a purpose for Doug's existence that would be morally sufficient for Doug to exist and then to experience justice for his action. Instead of answering this question, James assumes the answer is yes, but answers a separate question about whether or not God may have morally sufficient reasons from an eternal perspective for creating Doug destined to go to hell. And then, then James goes on to claim that there is some sense of justice in God judging Doug for perfectly obeying him. Now, so far, James has simply made assertions. That's it. Assertions to this Calvinist presuppositional philosophical commitment. James, this man who believes he was created incapable of rightly understanding spiritual truth is now trying to convince all of us of some profound spiritual truth, despite believing that we were also created unable to rightly understand spiritual truth. And so that's the idea. You get people going, well, I'm just, I'm just the victim here. I'm the poor victim. It's sort of like when we were looking at uh, what uh, Warren McGrew said about Judas. He's, he's just the victim, that poor man. I mean, he, he, was, he, was, uh, he was forced into this. He wanted to be a good guy, and God's standing behind him with the big bad gun and telling him, you be bad, bad, bad. When the reality is, what you see in Scripture, is God is constantly restraining the evil of man. In a previous video response to James, I noted that according to Calvinism, God has eternally and effectually decreed for Judas to do exactly what he did. There was never a moment where Judas was free or able to do anything other than betray Christ. Now, I never said Judas wanted to be a good guy according to Calvinism. This is James desperately erecting a straw man and twisting what was actually said to distract from the nasty entailments of his own position. James knows this is true, but he objects to it being pointed out. James then says God restrains the evil of man evil which he believes God effectually decreed. So here again, we see James positing a house divided, wherein God is restraining people from doing the very thing he effectually decreed them to do. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. We all must learn to think presuppositionally. I'm going to hell for eternity, correct? 
Yes. And it's not because of something that I did or didn't do. It's basically all God, right? Okay, to catch that, it's not because of something I did or didn't do. The judgment that will be rendered upon anyone will be based upon what you did or didn't do. James asserts that people are judged based on what they do. Yet, according to James, they were chosen by God before the foundation of the world to be vessels of wrath, and every evil and wicked act they would commit was determined by God in eternity, prior to creating this world. So, James has the proverbial cart before the horse. Men were eternally damned to hell, and they act accordingly. They're not judged because of what they did. They do what they do because they were eternally and effectually decreed to do so, judged before they ever existed. It is in the realm of time because that's the only place you've existed. You can't be, you can't be judged on the basis of something outside of this. According to Calvinism, men were elect unto salvation before the foundation of the world. All things, every evil, wicked act that men will ever do was determined by God in advance, as was his judgment of these evil, wicked acts. Men are merely acting this out in time. They believe God is sovereign, meaning meticulous determinism. James tries to bury this truth here by appealing to time. Yet elsewhere, he appeals to God's eternal and timeless purpose. This is what's known as... I guess you can't have your cake and eat it too, huh? The judgment that takes place is a judgment in time. It's a judgment based upon our doing what we desired to do. James, please stop. I mean, this, this is so terribly transparent. Why do we desire to do what we do per your system? Because God eternally and effectually determined for us to think, desire, and act exactly the way we do. You see, James is attacking Doug for arguments Doug didn't put forward here. He's answering questions no one asked, and he's taking offense for people questioning his beliefs as if they were freely doing so while claiming he believes they weren't. Now, James's response to Derek's blunt presentation of the anti-gospel is only more of the same. And I'll put links to the full thing down in the, the comments below. But his answers are not for the benefit of the unbeliever, but rather they're intended to obfuscate the real issues so as to convert believers to Calvinism, as well as placate those Calvinists whose consciences were bothered by what Derek said. Now, here's the gospel in as brief of a presentation as I can manage. God created us in his image and likeness, bestowing upon us freedom and self-determination, tasking us to be his representatives in creation. But Adam and Eve sinned, and they brought all sorts of problems into the world as a result. Sin, death, suffering, life's a futility. But their sin required that they either be eternally condemned to lives of suffering, futility, and ultimately death, or that they be redeemed. Now, God, in his love and mercy, chose the latter. He assumed the totality of human nature, becoming like us in every respect, and then living a perfect life, healing and redeeming our humanity. He suffered unto death, showing the depth of his selfless love, and then he rose again, conquering the hold of the grave and calling us to cease our rebellion and return to him, promising to freely pardon all who do. This is good news. We're not promised problem-free lives, but we are promised that in this life, we can know and be known by God, that our lives as a result of this relationship will be transformed into being better representatives of Him, that we'll become better at loving Him and loving others, that when we see Him, we will be like Him. Now, while we may still suffer and die in this life, we believe and have hope that He will return and he'll give us perfect bodies and fellowship with us in a perfect and fully restored world forever. Now, God desires mercy more than judgment, and he's demonstrated this love for you, for all of us. It's universal. He, he, he's calling all of us home. He's made provision for everyone, and he's set before us life and death. Now, it is stupid to knowingly choose death. 
but he will not force you to choose him as he loves you and he's made you autonomous. But it is as though God were making his appeal to you through this video to be reconciled, to choose life. Now, I appreciate you guys watching. Until next time, God bless. Take care. Repent and believe. Get, get.